Hello, my name is Stephen Smith. I am a neuroscientist and professor of physiology at Stanford University. And I am very happy to have this chance to talk to you today about array tomography. Array tomography is a new microscopy method developed in my laboratory initially for neuroscience applications. Lately, we've been seeing that it may be useful in other areas of cell and tissue biology, but in this lecture, we will concentrate specifically on neuroscience applications from my own Stanford laboratory. So what is array tomography? It's a microscopy method that allows for combinations of fluorescence microscopy and electron microscopy. In my lecture today, I'm going to talk mainly about the fluorescence microscopy forms of array tomography, but I'll give you a little taste of the electron microscopy capabilities and the way that the fluorescence and the electron microscopy can be used together. In both forms, array tomography is a volumetric imaging method. That is, it lets you image a three-dimensional volume in a specimen in the form of a digital image representing three spatial dimensions. It is proteometric, maybe a new word to some of you. The idea here is array tomography is capable of measuring many different proteins within a tissue. Not necessarily the whole entire proteome, as the name might be applied, but a good start at it, dozens of proteins. Last but not least, it is an ultra-high resolution method, and I will illustrate more of what I mean by that as we go along. So my lecture today is really going to be in three parts. In the first part, I will give you a very brief description of what array tomography is, how it's done, a very bare-bones explanation. Then I'm going to sh run through a little gallery of images from the neuroscience applications of array tomography that we have pursued so far in my own laboratory. And then in the final part of the lecture, I'll come back to more of the details about exactly how array tomography is done. So let's get started. The basic form of array tomography is illustrated in this little cyclical slide. There are a number of steps. Array tomography is more a process than it is something you do with a particular unique tool. So the method is essentially a histology. In other words, you have to begin by fixing a piece of tissue. So this is not one of these wonderful kinds of microscopy that you can use to look at the dynamics of life, but it is a very wonderful complement to those kinds of microscopy. And as a matter of fact, we're using in vivo imaging and array tomography as a histology in combinations. So the first step, for better or worse, is to fix the tissue. And I've indicated here very briefly the tissue is embedded in plastic. It is sliced, mounted on a precision glass, cover slip, stained, imaged, stitched together by digital computation, and finally stored on a desk for later appreciation or analysis. So this boils down into the three steps listed in the center of this little cycle. First, the three-dimensional specimen is sliced into a two-dimensional array of sections. Then, all the actual staining and imaging is done on those sections in the form of the TD, the 2D array. The acquired 2D images are then reconstructed into the form of a 3D imaging in, in the computer. Now, one of the really special features of array tomography and the thing that opens the door to proteometric imaging, as I uh, highlighted in my title slide, is that it is possible to reiterate a couple of those steps in array tomography in a way that allows for greatly increasing the multiplexing or multiplicity of proteins that can be imaged in a given specimen that's indicated on this slide here. So the idea is that there is an, uh, a, a repetition of cycles of staining the array, imaging it, wash the first round of stains off, repeat the process. So this is one of the really key features that has kept us going with the development of this new imaging technology. And then last but not 
least, certainly, uh, a unique feature is that after fluorescence imaging, um, as indicated in the previous two slides, it's possible to restain the specimen for electron microscopy and to image it with a field emission scanning electron microscope, which allows for perfectly correlated, indeed, conjugate electron microscopic images to go along with the proteomic fluorescence images. There's a little inset here from which you may be able to glean the fact that uh, scanning electron microscope images of array sections look very much like the traditional transmission electron microscopes of ultra-thin sections that you may be used to from many other areas of cell biology that have relied heavily over the decades on electron microscopy. Okay, so that is the outline of how array tomography is carried out. Now I want to give you a little galleries of examples to uh, further elicit your interest for the long haul of going through the details of the important details of how uh, array tomography is done. So these examples will all be drawn from research in my Stanford University laboratory, and there's just a little listing of some of the topics that we work on here. The sort of largest context is we're interested in exploring and better understanding the molecular architecture of neural circuits. Within that area, we're extremely interested in the molecular diversity of the myriad synapses that comprise the major signaling organelles of the brain. We're interested in mechanisms of synaptic plasticity. And last but not least, we're interested in better understanding and hopefully helping to develop new therapies for neurodegenerative diseases. In all of these project areas today, array tomography figures prominently. So unfortunately, I don't have time today to talk much about the logic or the meaning of any of these projects, but I do want to show you some examples of the array tomographic images we have produced. Okay, we're gonna start out with a very low magnification array tomography view of mouse cortex. What I'd like to do now is zoom in successively to show you how much detail it is possible to capture with array tomography. In this case, we'll be looking at a sing single fluorescence signal, namely the fluorescence of YFP that is expressed in a small subset of neurons in the particular transgenic mouse that this uh, image was made from. So here's a uh, section representing all six layers of the cortex and then some. The little magenta rectangle shows the area we'll zoom into on the next slide. There it is. And now you can start to see clearly the individual neurons. We're in layer five now, layer 5A at the top, 5B at the bottom. You can, I hope, see the dendrites, the spines on the branches, and if you get up real close, you might see some beautiful little axons threading through that volume. Now we're going to zoom in even further within the area of this magenta rectangle. And now I've prepared a little animation so you can better appreciate the three-dimensional nature of the image we are rendering. And so we're going to uh, revolve it through 360 degrees, but I'll probably get bored and move on to the next slide before we get all the way around. But I hope you can see very clearly here that this is a very detailed three-dimensional rendering and perhaps you're already beginning to appreciate the really superlative resolution and detail that array tomography is capable of delivering. And keep in mind that this level of detail that we see in this zoom in is present in that entire slab representing the entirety of the cortical layer structure. Okay, so let's look at some other pictures. Here's a uh, similar volume, but now in addition to fluorescent signals derived from the YFP, um, we've added fluorescence from the microtubule bundles um, present in the axons and dendrites of non-expressing neurons, and we've filled in uh, all of the synapses. The synapses have been colored in randomly just to make the point that array tomography is capable of fully resolving the individual synapses in three dimensions. And that capability is really a new one that was not shared by previous fluorescence microscopy 
methods. And this one is really the core of our research program on synapse molecular architecture and synapse diversity. Now we're going to look at a set of, of images that represent the ability of array tomography to capture lots of distinct protein channels. So I'm not going to try to really explain what's going on here. There are titles on this slide with the names of the protein antigens to which the antibodies that were used in this experiment are directed. Um, I'm going to flip through the slides and what I want you to grasp is that these four slides um, represent the exact same volume. If I flip back and forth, you can kind of see that those DAPI nuclei are sitting in one place. And now we're beginning to get a sense of what I mean when I say the molecular architecture of the brain. Um, maybe in your spare time you can take a look at these and think about what it might all mean. Um, we think it means quite a lot, but we're quite a ways from understanding it. I wish I had time to talk about this work a lot more now, but I don't. Now here's another slide that represents another aspect. I'll step out of the picture here so you can see the whole thing. These are synaptic markers in a piece of neuropill similar to that that's been illustrated in the previous slides. And this, these are outtakes from our work aimed at better understanding the molecular diversity of synapses. So here we see markers that indicate that some of these synapses are glutamatergic excitatory, some are GABAergic inhibitory, some have uh, neuroligin 2, which is a particular molecule associated with a subset of inhibitory neurons, and so on. Again, um, I'm sorry I don't have time to go into the very exciting science related to this slide, but this is just uh, to give you a better sense of what array tomography data looks like. Here is a way of representing the high dimensional proteometric data that may not be so pretty, it's certainly not so colorful, but we use this for the more careful analysis in my laboratory. So this is what we'd call a synaptogram. There are nine columns and something like 20 rows. All of these represent the same one cubic micron, so there's a number of serial sections lined up. Um, we have described synaptograms in several publications. I hope you'll find them and enjoy them. I don't have time to talk about them now, but I'm showing this slide to indicate um, that it is both necessary and important to go beyond staring at millions of beautiful colors when you're trying to um, understand the messages behind array tomography. So this is a bit of a more analytical approach, just a taste. Based on that approach, we have developed machine learning tools that can analyze raw data that is extraordinarily complex, like what you're seeing here. This is just Four, four fluorescence channels, but this is a subset of an experiment that had about 20 channels. We use the analysis, like the synaptogram in that slide, to craft machine learning tools that are capable of plowing through large data objects of this type and analyzing them, um, classifying them into subsets of synapses. So here's a classification into two subsets rendered in two different colors, again, just as an example. So here's the results of an analysis based on a classification scheme like the one I just described. And this uh, simply reports numbers reflecting the densities of different types of synapses at different depths within the cortex. Uh, these curves are actually based on the analysis of a million or so synapses. So it's a good thing we have computer algorithms to help us go through and count and classify and analyze all of those synapses. Here is a little bigger version of an electron micrograph made on a tomography array specimen. So I indicated earlier on in my brief once over that it was possible to obtain electron microscopic views of our tissue, in this case, mouse cortex. And maybe in this larger view, you can better appreciate um, you know, how really nice these micrographs are. This um, could pass as a pretty good 
traditional transmission EM, even though it's made in a completely different way. And um, in the last part of my talk, I'll come back to uh, how we can make this particularly potent by combining it with the fluorescence imaging. And as a final example in our little stroll through the array tomography gallery, here is a rendering, a really beautiful rendering of a really ugly thing. This is an image in uh, six colors of uh, Alzheimer's disease plaque that was um, imaged from a, an autopsy specimen of a human sufferer from Alzheimer's disease. So this is a little icon of our neurodegenerative disease program. Okay, we're gonna go through each step one at a time now. The first step is a chemical fixation and solvent replacement step where the idea is to um, preserve your piece of tissue with all of the biomolecules right where they started out, but to replace all of the water with an organic solvent compatible with the next step that we'll come to in just a second. And the procedures here are really nothing new. These are the procedures that have been developed by electron microscopists over the last few decades to perfect the arts of fixation and embedment for electron microscopy. Next we come to the embedment step. And here one of the uh, special uh, tricks in array tomography is to use one particular class of resin um, for embedding, and that would be an acrylic resin. Acrylic resins are better for post-embedding immunostaining, which is the lifeblood of fluorescence array tomography. So there's a number of acrylic resins that can be used. The point is this is not the epoxy resin that is used traditionally for electron microscopy. Okay, after inf infiltrating the resin into the dehydrated specimen, the resin is polymerized and now you've got your specimen in a solid block of plastic with ideally all of the biomolecules right where they were in that tissue's last moment of life. But now the tissue is embedded in a very hard piece of plastic. That piece of plastic can then be trimmed and mounted and prepared for sectioning on an ultramicrotome. So perhaps you've seen an ultramicrotome around. There's one in the picture in the center of the slide along with our wonderful uh, technician, Nafisa, who is our expert at working this particular tool. It is a tool that electron microscopists have been evolving for over half a century and is really quite spectacularly refined and capable in its present form. Um, it is capable of cutting a block of tissue embedded in resin in sections that are as thin as 40 or even 30 nanometers. These are very, very thin sections, and that's really where a lot of the magic in array tomography comes from. Okay, digging in a little deeper, zooming in a bit, this is the diamond knife boat, as it's called, mounted on the stage of the ultramicrotome. The tissue itself is um, on, is chucked up right where my fingertip is pointing. Maybe you can catch the glint of transparent plastic there. The blue item is a boat full of water. The water is actually critical. And then at the point where that boat meets the specimen, there is a diamond knife blade. This is a very, very sharp knife. This is a big piece of the trick of cutting tissue as thin as tens of nanometers. The next slide is a little movie. So now we've zoomed in closer still and you can see the microtome in action cutting off its thin sections. Um, the tissue block, the resin block is that uh, hemispherical looking thing sitting in the steel chuck of the ultra microtome. You can see the glint of the diamond knife blade. And then as the uh, cutting action of the microtome uh, moves the resin in a very precise way over the diamond knife. It is cutting one thin section of the specially trimmed block at a time. And each new section is neatly spliced onto the tail of the previous section to produce a ribbon that extends along the surface of the water. And if you look 
carefully, maybe you can see the incremental advance of a ribbon on the surface of the water. It all depends on how big the screen you're watching this on is. Um, what's actually going on there, here's a little cartoon I've prepared. Um, so the resin block is very precisely stroked down over the very sharp diamond knife, peeling off the ultra-thin section. The sections uh, glue themselves together to form that ribbon that was floating on the surface of the water because a thin layer of a tacky adhesive has been applied to the top and bottom of the block. So with each new stroke of the cutting action of the microtome, the leading edge of the section about to be cut is neatly spliced to the trailing edge of the preceding section. So this is you know, a rather exotic sounding trick. It's actually been around for decades and has been used by many electron microscopists for serial sectioning. We've kind of souped it up with better glues and so on. And the big difference here is we're going to make much longer ribbons. Whereas traditional electron microscopists make ribbons that are two millimeters long and put them on tiny little EM grids. We do something a little different, which you know, maybe you can get an idea of from the next slide. We grow those ribbons to be 40 or 50 millimeters long and pick them up on specially prepared precision optical cover slips. Um, we do this by reaching the cover slip down into the water of that little blue boat you saw. And the result is indicated in this cartoon. There's a cover slip with a neat row of something on the order of 100 serial sections sitting on that surface. And because of the treatment of the cover slip surface and the drying process we used, a permanent adhesive bond is formed between the ribbons, all of the individual sections, and the cover slip. So that is the array that gives its name to array tomography. Here is a close-up of sorts of one of those little ribbons. This is just a section of seven of the out of a hundred or so serial sections on the, on the ribbon, as you might see them if you popped that array under a low power light microscope. Um, then the array and its cover slip are mounted on some kind of a slide carrier and coupled to some kind of an apparatus for fluid staining of that cover slip surface. So you see one such apparatus in the uh, center of the field here. And the idea is that we can now apply aqueous fluid stains to the surface of the array. And uh, typically, the stains we use are antibodies. And they stain proteins embedded in the array plastic the same way you might be used to them studying, uh, to them staining proteins in a fixed cell in a dish. In a typical experiment, we might use three or four colors of antibodies in each cycle of staining. So this would correspond to the standard three to four channel indirect immunofluorescence that you might be familiar with from other lectures or from doing it yourself. Then after staining the array, we put it on the stage of an automated uh, fluorescence microscope with a digital camera. The automation controls motors that move the stage in X and Y and focus the microscope in Z. And the graphics on this slide just indicate a couple of the uh, extremes of the range of possibilities we can use to image the serial sections. In the simplest kind of experiment, we might just image a given spot within one spot within a section, then try to find the same spot in the next section, and move on, and repeat that um, for each section, for each of the hundred or so sections. Um, and in that way, acquire uh, serial section images throughout the ribbon. Another possibility is to make a mosaic, as indicated in the lower field here, where we tiled together um, enough individual high magnification microscope fields to capture images of the entire section. And that's what was done to acquire that large image that I 
showed you at the beginnings of our little walk through the gallery where we zoomed in and in and in. We were able to do that because we tiled together a very large field of view using the infinite patience of the automated motorized microscope to take, in that case, about 12,000 individual pictures while we slept and played and had fun. Okay, so here is a picture in real time of the microscope at work. You can't see much here. You can see the flash of the fluorescence illumination. Uh, during each of those illumination events, the digital camera is automatically snapping a picture. It's, um, if you watch carefully, you'll see there's four different colors here. Um, when it's done with all four colors at one spot, it moves over a tiny bit to work on acquiring the next spot according to one of the patterns that I described in the previous slide. Okay, now I'll remind you once more of the really special magic of array tomography, the thing that expands its multiplexing capability to a truly proteomic scale. And this is the fact that we are, after we've imaged um, one set of three or four immunostains, we can wash those antibodies off. All it takes is a change of pH by two or three units, either up or down, that disrupts the fit of the antibodies to their antigen. They wash off, and then we restain the array. If we restained it with the same four antibodies and imaged it again, we'd get the same answer. We have proved that to ourselves over and over. Now, the point is to restain it with three or four different antibodies each time, and that's how we get up to the high order multiplicity, the 10, 20, 50 is just around the corner proteins per specimen. Then, because the microscope doesn't do a perfect job of photographing each serial section exactly the same way, and because there's some uh, dimensional warping and distortion that occurs during the cutting process, we finally need to use a computational registration process. In the case of stitching together large mosaics, we also have to computationally stitch the large mosaics together. The fact is that algorithms for performing this work um, nearly flawlessly and highly efficiently are already available in the public domain. So a lot of computer power goes into this, but uh, in general, not too much human effort, and the results are quite nice. The result is a beautifully registered stack of images um, that is indicated in my little cartoon in the left here and amounts to a, uh, a three-dimensional image or an image representing three spatial dimensions, even though it may have 20 dimensions of color channels. And then finally, those images are stored on a hard drive. And as you might have figured out by now, this process tends to lead to what is coming to be known as big data, gigabytes, terabytes worth of data. This is um, a good thing, really, if you're trying to characterize a very intricate and elaborate tissue such as brain, but you've got the capability of acquiring large volumes in many channels, and we like tiny voxels. That's part of the game of high resolution. So you put those together in a little formula, and you end up with big data. And this is opening the door to some great new fun for bioinformaticians. I gave you a little taste in our gallery walkthrough of some of the bioinformatics analyses we're developing, but you know, with big data like this, you don't want to have to spend too much time analyzing it by hand. Okay, so I've described a procedure to you. I have claimed that it is extremely powerful, and um, I'm you know, meaning to imply that it is worth all the trouble I've described. Um, I've already indicated some of its singular advantages in terms of the high order multiplexing and so on. Um, on the other hand, many of you have worked with confocal microscopes. You're used to image stacks. You're, um, you know, some of you may be very good at working with this kind of data. And you may have been wondering, 
how array tomography compares with confocal microscopy. And it's not a simple comparison. Confocal microscopy can be used on living specimens. Array tomography cannot. So um, a confocal microscopy has its areas of application. But when it comes to high resolution and quantitative interpretation, um, we need to ask uh, questions like the one that I've indicated on this particular slide. So just as one example, um, uh, for quantitative interpretation of specimens like synapses in the brain, it's important to have high resolution on all three axes, and it's important to have results that are uh, of similar quantitative uh, value regardless of where they are within the specimen. Okay, so here's a little comparison of the best we could do with confocal microscopy and, um, and a, an average day at work with array tomography. And so in this particular comparison, we're just looking at one color. This happens to be an immunostain that stains all of the synapses in little pieces of mouse brain. And um, what we've done here is imaged two very similar volumes one with array tomography, one with an excellent laser scanning confocal microscope. And when we regard reconstructions of these volume in their natural XY plane from the top, we can see that they're somewhat similar looking. But if we check out the array tomography volume from the side, we can see that there is still very crisp resolution along the z-axis, along the focal axis. And we can see that the density and character of the spots is uniform throughout the depth of this specimen. So array tomography scores well on the important criteria of having isotropic high resolution, that is high resolution in all three axes, and for having a sensitivity that is independent of depth within the specimen. So we'll give array tomography a big yes. Now let's take a closer look at the laser point confocal volume. And what you can see here is that even though you know, it looks pretty nice from the top, um, it looks quite a bit different from the array tomography when you look at it from the side in this volume rendering. And you're just going to have to believe me that the array tomography is the one that's giving us the right answer. What you can see in the confocal volume is, for one thing, that all of the spots are stretched out drastically along the z-axis. That's because confocal microscopes, and really all microscopes that work with focused cones of light, have much worse resolution along the z-axis than they do in their x and y axes. You may have learned about that in another one of these lectures. Um, so the elongated shape of those particles along the z-axis is an artifact. And the other really conspicuous difference you can see is that the uh, apparent density or the brightness of those synapses falls off drastically within the seven micron depth of that specimen. There's at least two broad classes of reasons for that. One is that um, with the confocal, the antibody stain has to be applied and diffused through the depth of the specimen, and even with detergent permeabilization techniques, and even with multi-day incubations in antibodies, that process itself, the staining process, is highly depth dependent. And then there are imaging losses, losses in sensitivity due to light scattering and spherical aberrations and so on that accumulate rapidly with depth in the confocal microscope and result in a loss in sensitivity in imaging deeper parts of the specimen. So we're unfortunately going to have to give the confocal a great big no on these important uh, criteria of imaging quality. Okay, so what accounts for those advantages? I mean, these are both fluorescence images, uh, both made with fine high numerical aperture microscope objectives of the appropriate kind. Um, one major reason for the greatly enhanced resolution um, of the confocal microscope and greatly enhanced sensitivity for small objects is that all imaging is done right at the surface of a cover slip. And high numerical aperture objectives in general are 
designed to do their best only when the specimen is very, very close to the cover slip. And when you have to focus down even a few microns into an inhomogeneous specimen, as you do with a confocal microscope, there's a pretty disastrous accumulation of spherical aberrations and wavefront distortions that greatly perturb the imaging quality. So that's the first big advantage of array tomography. Next big advantage is that the physical sections we cut on the ultramicrotome, or that Nafisa cuts on our ultramicrotome, are very much thinner than the thinnest confocal optical sections. As a practical matter, they are generally less than one-tenth the thickness of the optical section. Therefore, an immediate tenfold boost in resolution along the otherwise troublesome z-axis. With array tomography, there are no out-of-focus photons. The specimen is so thin that it lies entirely within the depth of focus of the microscope. So there are no out-of-focus photons to eliminate with a pinhole or to um, add noise to the image. So these are a major limitation to image quality and they simply don't exist with array tomography because of the physical sectioning and because no part of the specimen is out of the uh, focal zone of the micros microscope. Part of the reason for the depth independence of array tomography is that depth on the two-dimensional array is virtual, that every aspect of stain diffusion and the imaging are completely dip depth independent because every volume element of the specimen is imaged exactly the same way. It's right on the surface of the cover slip. It is within nanometers of the stain in contrast to the, the situation of working with a tissue hole mount. And then finally, the you know, runaway advantage of array tomography is that it permits that iterative cyclic multiplexing I've already described. That strategy has been tried repeatedly with confocal microscopes, with cells, with tissues, and it doesn't work. You need the resin embedment to stabilize the tissue enough to withstand the effects of the antibody stripping wash. Last but not least, I will point out and show a few preliminary examples here of the friendliness of array tomography to super resolution microscopy. So um, I think you've probably had access to other lectures about super resolution microscopy methods like STORM and Mats Gustafsson SIM and STED. Uh, and another one here, uh, which is peculiar to array tomography and we like a lot, is the use of the astronomous 2D deconvolution algorithm called Richardson-Lucy. Um, all of these methods allow very substantial improvements in uh, resolution beyond the typical Abbe limit. And these work together with the extraordinarily good axial resolution we obtain by the phys uh, physical sectioning process um, to achieve really high resolution. I want to conclude by giving credit to the many people in my laboratory at Stanford and people that I have worked with really all over the world to develop this technology and some of the results that I've shared with you today. Please take a minute to read the names of the fine young people whose names are listed on this slide. <laughs>